Warships is almost rig proof because the players are all making the decisions. However, there is one variable that the producers could control. So the phone test seems rig proof because they don't have any control over who picks up the phone, right? Not so fast. They could have had a menu of options ready and changed it up if an MVP answered that they wanted to protect. The players all had complete control over the decisions during the circle of trust, except for one variable that I think the producers manipulated. And the final episode had two potentially problematic methods of elimination that were ripe for rigging and made many viewers suspicious. Was Squid Game the challenge fake? Was the whole thing rigged? Let's find out. I'm going to analyze all the ways the producers could have rigged the games and challenges to favor some players over others. And after breaking this all down, I'm going to give my verdict and final thoughts about what I think really went down at the end of this video. But first, let's get a couple things out of the way. A surprising number of people online have commented that they think the show is completely fake and all the contestants are actors and the whole thing was scripted. Here are some of the comments that I got on the 5 Squid Game Challenge videos that I made a couple of weeks ago. They say things like, they can tell it's fake because the players with the most screen times, the ones shown in the interviews, are the ones making it through. These people are called morons. Who are those morons? And have obviously never heard of something called post-production editing. In a show with 456 people, they obviously can't feature everyone, so after shooting, they spend countless hours sifting through footage to present a logical and entertaining narrative. As to whether the contestants are all paid actors, well, for one, many have social media accounts going back many years. Some of them might be influencers, but none of them are actors as far as I've seen. They're regular people. Engineers, delivery drivers, desk jockeys, scuba instructors, teachers, students. So we can discount the they're all paid actors theory outright, unless the producer somehow invented a time machine and went back to create elaborate Instagram and Facebook accounts for hundreds of people. These people also say they're obviously acting because look at all the over-the-top reactions and egos and crying and all the colorful personalities in there. Normal people don't act like that. And I can also tell that they're casted for specific roles. The villain jock, the crying mama's boy, the feel-good mom and son duo, etc. Well, first of all, the producers didn't just kidnap 456 random people off the street. They had about 80,000 applicants to choose from, and they obviously want to select a diverse group of players, including people with entertaining personalities and inflated egos and interesting backstories and probably even some borderline personality disorders. That's just good TV. To me, it's pretty obvious that the player interactions are organic and they're not reading from any script. If the producers did try to feed them lines to say, it would be immediately obvious. The vast majority of people are just horrible actors. They chose to eliminate. Hell, even a lot of professional actors are horrible actors. Well, if I can't do 69, I'll try 96. <laughs> well, good luck with that. How do you know this guy? I didn't break my thought you brought him. Hey, no. <laughs> What's that thing? Looks like a bridge of some sort. I like the looks of it. Oh, wow. It's bigger. You guys suck. Dicks. The point is, there are very few Meryl Streep's and Dano Day Lewis's out there who can act that convincing. As others have pointed out, if the whole thing was fake and scripted, do you really think that they would have chosen these three as the final three contestants? Three mild manner and polite introverts? I don't think so. Okay, so it's not scripted, but we also need to make a distinction between staged and rigged. Some people point to the fact that the producers use stunt doubles or manufacture some scenes as evidence that the whole thing is faked and rigged. The producers, who denied accusations of rigging, have admitted that there were some, quote, minor fictionalized and manipulated moments, end quote. But to me, that's to be expected when you're filming a reality competition show like this with 456 players. It makes complete sense that they need to use stunt doubles for safety reasons and manipulate certain things to get certain shots at certain angles to get proper coverage and things like that. But that's not what we're talking about. This type of staging and manipulation has no material impact on the outcome. What I'm going to be examining is how the producers could have manipulated things behind the scenes to favor certain players over others to engineer a desired outcome. Specifically, rigging would include predetermining certain players to make it past a challenge, 
or others to be knocked out, and also includes presenting a challenge as one of pure chance with even odds, but then engineering it to boost the odds of a desired outcome that favors certain players over others. All right, let's get into it. Attention all players. Red light, green light. Phew, where to start? You probably already read the Rolling Stone article that came out in February, right after they started shooting. I won't rehash it, but in a nutshell, some of the players that were eliminated spilled the beans and alleged all kinds of rigging. I'll talk about these allegations at the end of the video when I give my final thoughts. But in terms of rigging potential, this game is by far the one that is most prone to rigging and also the most tempting to rig. For one, you have to start out with 456 players. That's a lot of players to film and manage and to house and feed. No other reality show like this has had so many people, so it would be extremely tempting for the producers to find a way to cut this number down to something more manageable. They ended up with only 197 players left standing, which is suspiciously close to the 201 players in the original show. Imagine if the dorms were twice as crowded. With that many players, it's impossible to show every one of them being inked, so we're at the mercy of their editing and have no way of seeing who actually moved and who didn't. For example, the Rolling Stone article alleged that about 20 players who made it past the finish line in time were mad because they were inked anyway and booted. On the other side of the coin, if the producers had some players that they really liked, like Brighton and Lorenzo and Trey and his mom, they could have easily ignored any movement and we would have never seen it, unless it was too obvious to the other players. Let's call these players MVPs. These are the people that the producers love because they make for good TV. They're blunt and expressive and have no filter, or they're polarizing and abrasive. If people think that I'm not going to be myself for a split second, is it totally yourself? 1000%. They interpret you as abrasive. Then that's what you are. You know, that's what you are. That's what I think of you. A jerk off. You're not well liked. You're, uh, you're abrasive and off-putting. Or have an interesting or feel-good backstory. So there's a great temptation to try to keep these MVPs in the game for as long as they can. Okay, so what would be the fairest and the most rig-proof way to run this game? Well, it would be to use an automated motion-detecting sensor that would eliminate players, just like the original show. Maybe they considered it, but it would be too big of a risk to let a machine detect movement and eliminate players. I mean, they took seven or eight hours to film the scene. If they used an automated sensor, they probably all would have been eliminated eventually. Show's over in one episode. Last person standing wins. When you look at the clips of people supposedly not moving, you can still detect slight movements, like a slight body swaying or eye movements or heaving chest from breathing hard. The point is, all of these decisions to ink or to not ink were made subjectively by humans by producers sitting in a giant room with monitors everywhere. Man, that's pretty damn tempting to put your finger on the scale to keep certain players in while also knocking out others. Doesn't help, by the way, that they keep showing footage of the control room where the guards are supposedly monitoring players when we all know that they're just sitting there pushing random buttons. I'm just glad they didn't show the button that magically deletes and replaces footage just by double tapping it. Uh, yes, we want to design a security system that captures everything going on, so can you add a button that lets guards easily delete and replace footage? But I digress. My point is, if they did predetermine certain players that they wanted out, it would be pretty easy to find some slight movement to justify inking them. In fact, did you notice that whenever they showed players being inked, they just show the ink packs going off, but don't show the few seconds beforehand that would presumably show their supposed movements. The producers denied any allegations of rigging, but the allegations in the Rolling Stone article and other sources are pretty damning, but there could be a plausible explanation for all this besides rigging. But the fact remains, starting at the gate, there's a lot to be skeptical about that doesn't exactly instill confidence in the viewer that it's a fair and transparent process. You ruined the most important aspect of this place. Equality. Everyone is equal while they play this game. Here, every player gets to play a fair game under the same condition. For now, let's move on to the next game. Unlike Red Light, Green Light, Dalgona offers relatively little opportunity for rigging. We see the players organically forming four lines. Even if they wanted to protect their MVPs by giving them advanced knowledge of the game, there's an equal chance that any line could end up with the dreaded umbrella. Oh, no! 
know what I'm doing! I'm so f here! And they most certainly did not give them any heads up, otherwise all Squid Game MVP Brighton, perfectly playing the American cocky jock villain, wouldn't have been at the front of the line. The producers were probably crapping in their pants when they saw that he was third in line and almost knocked out. But then they breathed a sigh of relief when they realized that bedwetting Spencer was also in his group and would be easily browbeated into taking the umbrella by the devout Christian. Jesus had to compete. That means I have to compete. Listen, listen. Okay. Are you ready to go home? Are you ready to go home? Answer my question. Are you ready to go home? Yes or no? Are you ready to go home? It needs to be one, two, three, four. Shake my hand. Shake my hand. Shake my hand. Okay? I know I did the right thing. Somebody had to do it. Somebody had to put their foot down. God chose me, and I mean, I just went with it. Hey, please stop crying, bro. Jesus Christ. But one possible opportunity for rigging was when they passed out the cookies. I don't think it happened, but they could have baked some cookies that were easier to cut out. For example, if they stamped the shapes deeper to make it easier to cut out and put those in a special pile. When the player stepped up to get their cookies, the producers could have relayed a message to the guard's earpiece to give certain players an easy cookie. Aside from that, the only way they could have rigged it was to ignore it whenever an MVP broke their cookie and just decided not to show it and let them pass. In fact, this is exactly what happened if Brighton is to be believed. He admitted in an interview that he should have been knocked out in this round, but the producers let him pass. Quote, in the cookie challenge, I kind of lucked up and my cookie broke and I got passed and I was really surprised. Oh, the irony. He bully boys his way into getting the easiest shape, triangle, and still wasn't able to do it. I think most people would be too embarrassed to admit it, but since he admits that he got passed through, I have to believe that he wasn't the only MVP that got waved through on the DL. The strange thing is that the editing supposedly shows his completed cookie, but they could have later filmed him or a stunt double finishing the cookie instead. And by the way, this is the type of rigging that would be the easiest to get away with, allowing an MVP to move on. I mean, it's one thing if they were pulling strings to knock out a player, because that player would be mad and cry foul, as we saw in the famous Survivor lawsuit in 2001, which I'll discuss at the end. But who else actually witnessed Brighton breaking his cookie? No one, and they probably assumed he'd keep his mouth shut, which may have been what happened with other MVPs that they secretly helped. Attention all players. The phone tests were next. If you've forgotten, number 198 answers the phone and is given a plate of burger and fries. Later on, he answers it again, but then gets eliminated after he fails to convince another player to pick up the phone. So it's rig proof because they can't control who answers the phone, right? Not so fast. Let's say that an MVP picked up the phone the second time and they wanted to protect them. Well, they could have had a menu of different options teed up and then just cherry picked which challenge to use depending on who picked up the phone. So if an MVP answered the phone, they could have simply given them an easier challenge or one that couldn't result in elimination or just made them do 20 push-ups or something. Battleship is next. Uh, I mean warships. You've got the shining. You mean shining. Shh, you wanna get sued? This game is almost rig-proof because the players all choose where to place their boats and that decision is locked in. Also, the respective team captains decide which positions to hit. No wiggle room. So if an MVP like Brighton chooses to stand at C4 and the opposing team hits it, there's nothing the producers can do. What's a better spot than C4? C4. However, there is an opportunity for the producers to manipulate the order the teams played in, and I think they absolutely did. If you recall, everyone expected to be playing tug of war, and they dramatically revealed the bait and switch to warships. Oh man, this is not tug of war at all. To maximize the shock and surprise of the plot twist, which team would the producers choose if they had their choice? It would be Brighton. The guy who was doing push-ups and dips and chirping about how confident he was that his team was going to dominate. I really, really like my odds. I see other lines and groups run around like chickens with their head cut off, but my line, we're chilling. This is tug of war. Nobody's worried. Nobody's stressed because there are some large men and strong men on our team. 
So was it a coincidence that his team was randomly selected first so that they could capture the look of shocked surprise that they weren't playing tug of war? No way, man. At first glance, the guard pulled balls three and one from the two boxes as if they were randomly drawn, but I really doubt that the order was drawn at random. Before the guards pulled the balls, the producers could see who was standing in which line and could have taken their time to determine their preferred order and then brought out two rigged replacement boxes. The way the show is edited, there's no way to tell how much time has actually elapsed in between segments or what happened in between. For example, we had no way of knowing that Red Light Green Light took seven to eight hours to film. We conveniently cannot see inside the boxes, so they may have been pre-positioned in a line on a track maybe, so that the guards would pull the balls out in a predetermined order. If they really wanted to choose the team order by random, there's a number of different ways to do it in a transparent way, like one of those clear lottery boxes with the ping pong balls. In fact, if it was not rigged, it would make more sense to have one single box and then have the next two balls pulled facing off. It makes more sense, otherwise you would have eight balls in two boxes so that you could potentially have team one playing team one. So the fact that they used two boxes provides some evidence that they predetermined the order. So while I do think they rigged the order, this really isn't a big deal since each team and each player still has to play the game and has the same odds no matter which team order they play in. In other words, no advantage or disadvantage is given, so no harm, no foul in my opinion. Attention all players. Next up is the first dorm elimination test where three players are voted out. You got this. On its face, this test seems pretty rig proof. After all, the players all decide where to stand in line and they all have an individual say over who they choose to vote out. I mean, not unless they somehow knew Lorenzo was predisposed to being anti-Apple and is usually a prick when it comes to accepting free fruit. But if they did want to rig the vote, they still could have. How? Well, we don't actually see how each of the 73 players voted, so we all have to trust that they're accurately counting up the votes. I'm not saying that they did rig it, but in a fairly close vote, they could have easily moved some votes around. The only risk is if the players all took a survey afterwards to audit the results. But even then, they would have plausible deniability since not all of the players would honestly reveal their true votes to the group. I personally don't think this was rigged because otherwise they would have tipped the scales to keep Lorenzo in and not let him get voted out. I mean, that dude is a perfect character for this kind of show. Obnoxiously opinionated and blunt and polarizing and colorful and had zero filter. He and Brighton were elite Hall of Fame level MVPs. By the way, I was really surprised by the number of supporters and fans both those guys had who commented on the videos that I made about them. What about the second dorm elimination test? This test was rig proof in my opinion. Five volunteers went up and chose to stand behind a jack-in-the-box that offered one of three choices. The players volunteered at their own volition and decided which box to stand behind. The option for each jack-in-the-box was locked in, no opportunity to change it, so this one was played straight up. The producers had no choice but to roll the dice on this one, and I have a feeling that they were bummed out that the Ganbu Gang leadership duo were eliminated. Especially Rick, who was a feel-good store and a popular character that they probably hoped would make it farther. Best birthday ever! 69! Oh, you real 69, huh? <laughs> Let's never do that again, okay? The treat is a picnic. <laughs> Next up was the Picnic Bait and Switch. I was a little surprised that none of the players saw this one coming. Squid Game loves to pull bait and switches. If anyone was thinking ahead, they would have remembered that Marbles was the next game and that they were tricked into pairing up with a partner. Or maybe some players did figure it out, but they just didn't show it so that the surprise would be dramatically revealed by Trey and Leanne. Someone commented in my video about Mai that they thought she did figure out the bait and switch because her BFF in there was Chad and she was standing right next to him, so you'd think she'd want to picnic with him, but instead she ended up finding someone else, possibly so that she and Chad could both have an opportunity to advance to the next round. So what could the producers possibly do to protect their MVPs? Nothing that I can think of. They knew that they would lose half the players and couldn't do anything to impact the outcomes. The players all voluntarily paired up, they individually decided which Marvel's games to play, or not to play, and they had to play them straight up. 
but I bet they were secretly delighted that Trey and his mom decided to picnic together so that they could milk the high-stakes emotional mother-son winner-take-all competition to mirror the emotion of the original show. Attention all players. The test of allegiance started with 31 players and they stated that exactly 11 players would be eliminated. This is a pretty smart way to go about it. They wanted to end up with exactly 20 players for the glass bridge, so they had to choose a way to go from 31 to exactly 20 players. In terms of rigging, this one was also rig proof. The players themselves chose a captain, TJ, who got a free pass, and then they went down the chain with each player deciding themselves on one person to save. Not much to say about this one. Of the remaining players, I think the producers were happiest that Trey made it through. Of all the remaining players left at the start of this round, I personally didn't see any other obvious MVPs left that they would have been rooting for. Hello players, let me welcome you all to the Now it starts to get interesting. The glass bridge. Let's start with the selection process. I was glad to see them use the claw machine because the number jerseys were already locked in and the players themselves chose which one to pull, which ensured a fair and random draw. The use of stunt doubles in the glass bridge got a lot of press, but is actually irrelevant to the question of rigging. Through player interviews, it came out later that the players did not actually drop down, but instead were instructed to do a little squat to make it look like they were falling, and then a professional stunt person would quickly replace them to take the fall, which is why we never see the fall in a single, unbroken take. Trey, what are you doing? No! But this itself isn't any evidence of foul play. Do you really think that Netflix lawyers would allow players, including older players who wear glasses, to suddenly drop down through a small platform? Yeah, no way, man. And we were going to start killing off people over 40 next? But was the safe path of the glass bridge locked in, or was it rigged? Like many others, I was really skeptical. It would have been very tempting and easy for the producers to rig this game. We can't tell how it actually functions, but they could have rigged it up by constructing it so that every single plexiglass panel would be capable of opening up and they could make a decision on the spot from the control room. The most obvious remaining MVP was Trey. They probably hoped that he had a higher number and would be safe in the back, but they couldn't control that. Notice that he safely made his first two jumps. If they did rig it, they probably figured it would be too obvious if he miraculously made it all the way through. Two to the power of 15, one in 32,768. Nice try though. Of the remaining players, the one with the most interesting storyline at that point was probably Ashley since she refused to overtake Trey and only made a single 50-50 jump before making everyone else pass her up. I actually made a whole video about it, and that one's my most popular video by far. So if the producers had their choice, they probably would have tried to keep her in the game just to see what kind of dramatic fallout would play out. Of course, that's exactly what we saw. And she ended up surviving her 50-50 jump and advancing to the next round. For what it's worth, the producers claimed that they had an independent adjudicator verify that only one safe route was predetermined in advance. Twelve players survived the glass bridge and the dice test was next. They wanted to end up with exactly nine players in the circle of trust, so they chose a game where exactly three players were eliminated by rolling a six. Not much to say here, this one was purely a game of chance without any opportunities for rigging. If there was an MVP that they wanted to protect, there would be no way of protecting them because it was literally a roll of the dice. You are now on the inside of what I like to call the Burns family circle of trust. The circle of trust was an interesting one to analyze. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be any opportunities for rigging because the players are all making the decisions. They're deciding whose desk to put the gift on, as well as deciding who they think gave them the gift. But the one variable that the producers did have control over was the order in which the players' shoulders were tapped. There are plenty of other variables, but I think the order in which they compete matters most. No shit, Sherlock! If your shoulder was tapped, then you're immediately at risk for being eliminated because you had to gift another player, and if that player correctly guessed it was from you, you're out. The order matters because the odds change with each round because there are fewer and fewer players as the game went on. Some have commented in my video about Mai that they thought the producers rigged it for her to win it all. 
I don't know if this is true, but the Circle of Trust provides some evidence that the producers wanted her to make the final three. What do I mean by this? If the producers did consider her an MVP, or at least a late stage MVP when they were down to a handful of players, they would try to protect her by boosting her odds. As the first player to be tapped, she had to gift another player who in turn has a 1 in 8 chance of guessing correctly, if you take skill out of the equation and the other player chose randomly. Whether it was by design or by accident is another matter for debate. Now, contrast this to the last player to be tapped, Phil, after there were only four players standing. Phil put his gift on Haley's desk, who then had a 1 in 3 chance of guessing correctly. In other words, Phil himself had a 1 in 3 chance of being eliminated. But if they really wanted to protect Mai, then she would have gone last instead of first. It turned out that Sam was the only player that was never at any risk. He was never tapped on the shoulder, and no one put a gift on his box. So perhaps a better argument could be made that the producers were favoring Sam the most since his shoulder was never tapped. Each round guarantees that at least one player is eliminated, so the last player is never tapped. When it comes down to the final four and there was only one player that had to go, the producers had one final decision to make whether to tap Phil's shoulder or Sam's, because Mai and Haley had already been tapped. So this is another decision that changed the odds in favor of one player over another. Because they tapped Phil, he had a 1 in 3 chance of getting booted. Of course, Phil could have gifted Sam, but that's not a decision that the producers had any control over, and they also knew that it was unlikely to happen since those two were late-stage BFFs. And now, the final episode. This is the episode that most people have focused on when they cried foul because the last two methods of elimination were so ripe for rigging. Attention producers, if you're listening, you do yourself a favor next season by not choosing elimination methods that viewers will immediately be suspicious of. After the fancy steak dinner and some awkward small talk, they revealed the three button machine. One button is gray, which means you're neither in nor out. One button is red, which means you're out. The last button is green, which means that the person pushing it is automatically in and also gets to choose who their final so opponent sorry. is. When they announced this, I immediately knew that it put Mai at a disadvantage, and you can tell that she realized this as well. Green, which means the player who pushes it goes into the final and chooses a player to join them. She immediately picked up on the fact that she should try to go first because Sam and Phil were BFFs and would choose each other if they got green. She played it perfectly though. Instead of being too quick to volunteer to go first, she sat back and didn't say anything to read the room. I know that for a fact. I don't want to press Neither Sam first. nor Phil wanted to go uh, first, moment, but she didn't know scared. that, so she sat back and waited for them to talk first before finally offering to go. Does anyone In any case, like many first? others, my spidey senses were tingling when they revealed this thing, and I immediately suspected that they might have built it just so they could rig who the final two players would be. No one else has broken this down in detail, and some people are apparently confused as to exactly how the rigging would work, so here goes. First of all, why would the producers want to favor one of these oh players gosh, over another? So well, right to make things more exciting and to appeal to the wide range of viewer demographics, it makes sense that they would want to end up with two players that were in sharp contrast since the show is watched by millions around the world. That means of the final three, if the producers had their druthers, they would most certainly want Mai to be in the final because it would feature a straight, older Asian American woman facing off against a younger gay man. And of course, that's exactly what we saw. So let's say for the sake of argument that they favored Phil over Sam for whatever wow. reason and wanted to end up with Mai and Phil. How could they engineer to make this happen? Well, they could not ensure that those two would face off, but they could ensure that at least Mai would make it through and face one of the other two. Now, it's almost too obvious to mention, but it would be extremely easy and tempting to rig up an electronic machine with three buttons to show whatever button they chose from the producer's control room. If the producers did rig it, they would want to give the illusion of player control by asking them to decide on who pushes the button first. They have no control over that, but no matter the order, they can still influence the outcome. To jog your memory, what went down was that Mai went first and it went gray, which means that she was neither in nor out yet. 
They could have chosen green, which would mean that it would be at least my and one of the other two, but shows like this, of course, prefer to milk the drama. Then Sam went next and his button went red, so he was out. Ripped if his button came up green, then he would most certainly choose Phil to be in the final, so my would be out. But what if Phil went second instead and they wanted him to be in the final too? Well, they wouldn't want to go green because then it would probably be Phil and Sam in the final. If Phil did go second, they would also have to have him go red just to ensure that at least Mai made it into the final. But what if Phil was the first to push the button? Then it would not come up green because otherwise he'd pick Sam. Red would eliminate him too, so they'd probably choose gray. If Sam went second, he would get red and be out. If Mai went second, then she would go green and the producers would have to be satisfied that at least Mai was in the final with whichever person she chose. Attention players, 287 and 451. Now to the final that game. So the first cool. way that they could that have stacked so the deck cool. is if they knew in advance that Mai was good at rock, paper, scissors, like if she maybe mentioned in her casting interview that she played it a lot growing up. That's possible, but unlikely in my opinion. But the more problematic thing was the safe that supposedly had only one correct key to unlock it. If this were truly the case, the producers are taking a pretty big risk if someone picked the correct key the first time. That's the worst case scenario for a game show in terms of milking the drama. I mean, what a letdown to the grand finale. First key wins it all, the end. So it would be, again, extremely tempting to rig it up so that the locking mechanism was electronically controlled by the producers, which would be easy to do. In other words, none of the keys actually open it so that they can decide exactly when the safe would be open and by whom. There's not much to say about this last one except that it was designed poorly if you were trying to choose a transparently fair way of arriving at a final winner to leave no doubt in the minds of the viewer as to whether it was rigged or not. Before I say what I really think happened, let's talk about the legalities involved in rigging a reality competition game. Many viewers probably remember the lawsuit involving Survivor in 2001, where a former contestant sued the producers for fraud, breach of contract, and unlawful business practices after alleging that the producers manipulated things behind the scenes to get her voted out. They ended up settling out of court, but for many it was the first time people have ever heard of this sort of litigation. In fact, it was because of this lawsuit that these type of shows started hiring independent adjudicators to reduce their legal liability. But if you go back farther in history, you'll read about a huge scandal in the 1950s involving American quiz shows, which were hugely popular at the time. Eventually, it came out that the producers of these shows were being influenced by sponsors and were absolutely rigging games by feeding answers to contestants and prearranging the winners and losers. It was a big deal and involved a New York grand jury and investigation, and when the dust settled, people's reputations and careers went down the toilet, and most of the quiz shows were pulled off the air by the end of the 1950s. In fact, it was such a big deal that Congress got involved, and President Eisenhower signed a new bill into law that amended the Communications Act of 1934 that made it illegal for any game shows to engage in this type of rigging or deception. End of story, right? Not so fast. During the Survivor lawsuit, some legal scholars noted that the law used, quote, narrowly tailored language, unquote, to cover reality competition shows that challenges players, quote, intellectual skills, intellectual knowledge, or chance, unquote. So in other words, shows like Jeopardy, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, or Wheel of Fortune. These legal experts also pointed out that it would be extremely difficult to hold shows with formats like Survivor accountable since players are voted off by other players or a panel of judges. Even worse, the FCC doesn't even have jurisdiction over Netflix because it's not a broadcast show but instead is an internet streaming service. Some other factors to consider. Unlike the original Korean series, this show was produced and filmed in the UK. I'm not an attorney, but this brings up some interesting questions. Did Netflix specifically choose to film in the UK because it had weaker laws around this protecting them? Since Netflix is an American company and a large chunk of their viewers are American, does this make a difference? Now back to the Rolling Stone article, which interviewed players that were eliminated during Red Light, Green Light. In addition to alleging injuries resulting from poor health and safety standards, these players alleged all kinds of rigging. That some players moved but weren't inked, while others made it but were inked for no reason, 
and basically claimed that they were only hired as one-day extras because they had fake microphones and already had their return flights booked right after this game. In terms of rigging, all this sounds very damning. But can we take it all at face value? Let's keep in mind that all of these quotes were anonymously attributed, presumably because of the non-disclosure agreements. But for some reason, the NDAs haven't stopped many other players from giving personal interviews where they dish about all kinds of inside scoop. My point is that all of these allegations were made by contestants who were knocked out in the first round after enduring a freezing eight-hour shoot, and some of them are considering legal action. Newsflash, some humans exaggerate and lie, especially when they're salty and giving anonymous quotes and trying to get a payday. Similarly, reporters using anonymous sources have also been known to exaggerate or not properly vet their sources. It's also interesting to note that those contestants have only threatened legal action, but nothing has been filed yet, which may be evidence that they're talking out of their asses. As a counterpoint, plenty of players have come out in support of the producers and have stated that they felt that the show was run in a fair and safe manner. The producers themselves have responded to some of these allegations. For example, they explained that it was true that not all the microphones were real because they didn't have 456 working mics. And also they booked all the 456 players with return flights home right after red light, green light, and they just extended the departure dates as players continue to advance. To me, the fake extras theory doesn't hold water. They had 80,000 applicants to choose from. It would be just as easy to find 456 interesting people than to pre-select a bunch of them to be eliminated in the first round. Some of this could also be explained just by poor planning and execution versus rigging. I mean, this is the first time that any show like this has tried to do this with so many people at once. So it sounds great, but what's your verdict, Robin? So your verdict? Two and a half stars out of five. So how do we make sense of all this? Was it rigged or not? From our limited view based on their editing, it's impossible to say for sure. Are you sure? But when you add it all together, my sense is that even though they had plenty of rigging opportunities, Squid Game The Challenge was probably run in a mostly fair way. Oh, well, that's an easy bush answer. The fact that they hired independent adjudicators showed that they at least knew that they could be in legal hot water if they got caught rigging the outcomes. I have no doubt that the producers were well aware of the Survivor lawsuit, or at least had Netflix lawyers that were whispering in their ears to watch their step. Even if they weren't worried about the FCC, they still had a strong incentive to avoid any civil lawsuits by salty contestants, as well as any bad rigging publicity. But there are a couple of cases that give me pause. I'm going to be extremely skeptical about all this. The first is a red light, green light. Starting with 456 players, they had a massive incentive to drastically cut down that number, which is probably why they made it so difficult and it took seven to eight hours to play out. Even though the players were frozen for up to 30 minutes, did they really have the bandwidth to accurately and fairly monitor 456 players at the same time? With so many players, it would be easy to pull all kinds of things that could be left on the editing table. They could easily knock out a bunch of players for any slight movements, while also pretending not to notice if an MVP slightly moved. Number one. On the other hand, maybe there were a bunch of other interesting MVP characters among the 456, but we just never saw them because they were among the 259 players wiped out immediately. For every Brighton and Lorenzo, there might have been 10 more MVPs that we just never saw. But for me, the most damning evidence for rigging was Brighton admitting that he broke his cookie but was waved through anyway. That's hole number two. That's a big one. Again, helping a player on the down low would be the easiest type of rigging to get away with, and it makes me really wonder what other things went down that they never showed. At the same time, I think it was unlikely that the other games were rigged, even though they could have been rigged, like the glass bridge, the three button machine, and the safe, because it would be too hard to get it past the adjudicators unless they were completely in cahoots with the producers. Joey, I think they're both in cahoots. All right, all right. And while there were plenty of opportunities to rig the outcome, there were also way too many games and challenges that were based on dumb luck, like the dice game, or based solely on player decisions like warships and the test of allegiance. So my final verdict is that I think the Squid Game Request Challenge accepted. was played mostly clean, except for a handful of incidents where they were able to secretly put their thumb on the scale. In the end, the biggest part of this, to me, comes down to the so-called independent adjudicators. Exactly how independent were they? 
Were they hired by Netflix or by the producers themselves? If they were hired mainly for legal cover and to create the impression of fairness, then maybe they knew to play ball and pretend not to see things while still giving their stamp of approval that everything was on the up and up. Well, I didn't want them to think that we were in cahoots. A note to the producers, if you want to deflect any perceptions or accusations of rigging in season two, I would strongly suggest that you keep in mind that a large chunk of viewers are already suspicious, so you should avoid any devices or mechanisms that could be rigged up, especially electronic devices. Instead, make sure that every decision is as transparently random and rig-proof as possible, such as using the claw machine, jack-in-the-boxes, or a lottery ping-pong ball device that viewers can see operating with their own two eyes. And also, if you're looking for a game design consultant slash independent adjudicator, you know how to reach me. I'm just looking out for you guys, because if you pull any more electronic button machines in the final round next year, you never know what kind of viewer backlash you might find. Sure, you're pretending not to know how this works! How did you do it, huh? Spill it! Players, what you witnessed before you is what remains of those who broke the rules for their own benefit. They tainted the pure and fair ideology everything here has been built upon. Each and every one of you is considered an equal within the walls of this facility. You must be guaranteed the same opportunities without being disadvantaged or facing any kind of discrimination. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm sure there are a lot of agreements and disagreements with everything I said, so let's hear it in the comments. Where do you think I got it right or wrong? What did I miss? I didn't watch a lot of player interviews, so there were probably a lot of things that came out that I'd love to hear about. Request accepted. <laughs>